Welcome back to Backward Point Podcast. My name is Nazar Sayed and with me is my brother and my co-host. Bashar Sayed. Today's podcast is about the Pakistan-Australia review. Apologies for it being a little too late. Uh, we have mentioned before that there is a new baby in the house and just lots of constraints regarding that. We weren't able to shoot the podcast last night. This is a full 24 hours later. Uh, we have perspective. We have ideas. Uh, we have a lot of time. We've, we've spent some time with the highlights, with other people's opinions of what has happened. And we have our own. And I'm hoping, Bashar, that today we will be able to do a nuanced conversation. Because I've seen a lot of reactionary stuff online, be it Twitter, social media, all of that. I've seen a lot of reactionary stuff from from fans. And then there's always those seasonals that come in and they have opinions that are like the most outrageous things you've ever heard. But on this podcast, we've maintained the fact that we're going to be rational and we're going to be constructive. Yes. So the criticism will be constructive. Now, at the same time, we've maintained also uh, a standard on this podcast to be positive and not be destructive. And I really want to differentiate between toxic positivity and just positivity. Those are two very different things. So on this podcast, we might be critical. Uh, we might be a bit emotional, a bit upset, a bit pissed off. That Those are all valid emotions. And that's what you're feeling. Then that's totally fair. But at the same time, we have to be critical as well. Like there are glaring issues that we have to discuss. And we will do that. This podcast is sponsored by Patreon. Honestly, the Patreon subscribers, they are the re reason that the podcast goes live every day and the reason that we're able to keep doing what we're doing, paying our editors and all that. So thank you very much, the Patreon family. We are taking Patreon questions throughout this podcast. Uh, there's a bunch of vari variated topics that everybody wants us to discuss. Patreon questions will be in there somewhere. So you know, stick around for that. Bashar. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to the Discord fam. Please, go ahead. I mean... I've watched cricket for a long time and my main source of entertainment always used to be Twitter. Yeah. Twitter was where it used to be at with the memes and the real time, you know, funny stuff, commentary, match analysis. But this Discord community has become a lot more than I, what I thought it could be. It's taken a life of its own and it is just the absolute place to be during any match, but more specifically during a Pakistan match. Um, memes are coming in real time. There's commentary, there's analysis, there's match uh, previews and reviews. And most importantly, I think whenever Pakistan wins or loses, we try to incorporate the vocal lounge that is the PCT therapy. And so we did the same thing the last match. Uh, I announced it on the announcements tab. We're doing a PCT therapy. We're there for 30 minutes, took questions from people, let people go on the mic and vent. So if you haven't already joined the Discord community, the link is in the bio, in the description, and it is absolutely free to join in. And you can also have a chance to interact with us because we're in and out of that community as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, during the games, I'm always there. The live com the live commentary uh, chat channel, that's the place literally to be. It's quicker than Twitter is. Because Twitter, you got to wait for it to load. Sometimes even quicker than the actual match because someone has an Prince ESPN. Gil. Prince Gill is, uh, I don't know who, what he's doing. He's in the game or not. I feel like he's, he's at like, the ground. He's two balls ahead of the game. Like they don't even know what's going to happen. And this guy calls it. <laughs> so like it's funny banter. It's actually a very positive and productive community as well. Like there are a few instances where people come in and try to be, you know, cheeky and they're immediately banned. So, like, we have a good moderating system. It's a very fun place to be. Like, the rest of the World Cup is going to be... The only reason that I'm coping is because of that Discord server. And, you know, obviously the Patreon fam is also there incorporated. So, it's just a good place, good time all around. I just think this is going to be a very difficult podcast. I've been not really avoiding it, but I think 24 hours in, I've had time to absorb the, the, the defeat and... I just think there's a lot of difficult conversations which we will have in this podcast. And some I don't think we are ready for. Some I don't think our listeners are ready for. But it has to happen. It's, it's the need of the hour. Um, I before, think Before we yeah. start, Bashar, I, I mean, I'm not going to do a proper match review. Everybody knows what happened. Pakistan lost by 62 runs, trying to chase 367. The first innings was abysmal, disaster. They pulled it back in the last 10, 12 but it was just a shocking performance in the first 37 overs, I would say. And then the Pakistan came out to bat. At one point, they were looking like 
they were going to chase this down around the 37, 38 over mark again when they had three wickets down and they only needed about 120 off like the f- last 13 or something. And the equation was very doable is what I'm trying to say. And something happened. Pakistan lose n- uh, nine wickets for 110 or something. Like, some weird number like that. I, I'm gonna. We're going to get to that. We're going to totally dissect all of that. But like I said, I want to bring nuance to this conversation right off the bat. I'm going to ask you one question, Bashar. Go ahead. Before the before the World Cup started, this podcast said that this is the best team to go into the World Cup since 1999. Four you game, said that, buddy. Not me. Four games in. How do we feel about that statement? I think we were probably being overly optimistic with that statement. If you look at it, I think even the, the team of the 2011 was probably better because of how balanced it was, because of how good the spin department was. We always said this, and it's a very common saying in cricket that batting wins you matches, bowling wins you tournaments. And I just think with not having proper spinners, not having any mystery variation in our in our spin department, and also with the loss of Naseem Shah, our bowling looks very one-dimensional, just putting it out there. Our batting without an informed Fakhar, without a bower who's not capitalizing on starts, is also looking very one-dimensional. There's nobody who can really put the impetus in and have a aggressive start. And that's mainly because Fakhar is not there. Yes, Abdullah is good. Imam is great. But they're not the batsmen who you would count on to score big runs while chasing 360, 350. So just, I think, maybe in hindsight, looking back now, we may have overestimated what this team could do. And now that you know they're performing, it's the same issues that they were walked in with the with the into the World Cup and towards the later half of the Asia Cup. It's the same issues, and uh, it's sad that we're still here talking about the same exact things, like you know Shaheen not bowling too well, um, Hassan Ali coming in for Nasim Shah, Babur not scoring runs in clutch matches, uh, Pakistan just batting collapsing. It's the same thing year over year, the same story, different characters. Pakistan was the number one team going to the Asia Cup. Pakistan was the number two team going to the World Cup. Wait, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, that's so. My, let's talk about the rankings. So, who did Pakistan face to get to the number one ranked side? Right. So, this is something I wanted to talk maybe later in the in the podcast. But let's talk about it right now. Uh, Pakistan faced a B string Australian team. This is an Australian team that was without St- uh, Stark, Cummins, Hazelwood. Uh, maybe Warner. I think even David Warner. Warner was in because um, this in is the Warner's fourth consecutive century against Pakistan in fourth consecutive games. Yes, and it spans about three or four years. So exactly. I, I don't think he came into that ODI squad. Yes, so so that was the Australian team that we beat in Pakistan, and then we faced a West Indies team. West Indies, who we all know, not even part of this World Cup, so it's a very weak team. We also faced a New Zealand B team uh, earlier this year, then then a New Zealand C team uh, earlier this year. So. Um, the problem is, I don't blame the players. I don't blame Babar Azam. Uh, but that's just the fact of the matter that Pakistan is number one because they're facing weaker teams. And that's also a huge issue because when you get to World Cups and you haven't faced top teams and then you suddenly go against a Stark, a Warner, um, a, 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 um, what's his name? Mitchell Marsh, right? Cummins, Hazelwood. You don't have the experience of playing against these top teams. And the, the, the other pro- problem is that Babar Azam, because he wanted to maintain those rankings um, for the team, he never really tested out his bench strength. You know, you you played your A-list team against a Netherlands. So you're in this conundrum now where you your, your A-list team is not performing. You've had some injuries. And because you played your A-list team against every single team, you don't have a prepared bench strength to fall back on. Like you literally had to call in Zaman Khan out of somewhere in the counties to come and play the Asia Cup game against Sri Lanka. So it's a mixture of bad planning. It's a mixture of bad scheduling. Uh, and that's just what I have to say about that. I'm going to say two words and I want your honest reaction. Those the 11. So the, the here's the thing. So who should be in the team? If not those the 11, like, are we saying there's like, a Viv Richards in the dressing room somewhere in Pakistan? Is there the next Wasim Akram sitting somewhere on TV that's doing analysis? Like, who are we missing here? Like, why are people saying, bring back Muhammad Am? Like, that's, that, that's such a stupid thing for me to hear because the man hasn't played any list day games since the past four years. He doesn't want to play for Pakistan. 
It might have seemed, yes, I understand. That could be a potential area where Bob Rupp missed out on. I would have loved to see a combination where Imad fits into your 11, maybe even 15-man squad. So you could have that option to, like if Nawaz is not performing, you can bring in Imad. Or if there's a spinning track, you can play Nawaz and Imad and Shadab. Like that would have been a really strong 11 because if you look at our neighbors, you know, India has played Akshar Pardale, Jadeja and Ashwin uh, and Kuldeep sometimes uh, together in the same 11. So if India can do it, why don't we have the ability to experiment? Babar Azam to me looks like a very, he's too predictable. Like on this podcast, we've predicted exactly what he's going to do, what he might do. And I would say 70 to 80% of the time we get it right. So uh, he doesn't have anything to think out of the box. He's very, he's too straightforward. It's too predictable. What is about Mohammed Nawaz that really tickles Babar Azam? Why is he, he's, he's come out publicly, you know, that video that came out from the PCB when against India, tu mera match winner hai, you are my match winner. Why is Mohammed Nawaz the match winner? I've seen some pictures of Babar Azam and Mohammed Nawaz back in the under 16 days. So, you know, at this point you can say Babar and Nawaz have been playing together for the past 15 years, maybe. If my if I have my math right, so it's a it's a matter of Babar knowing maybe what the true potential of Nawaz is, and Babar continuously backing Nawaz. Um, so, what is the true potential of Nawaz? What what is Babar Azam seeing that we're not seeing? He's been in the team consistently for three years, correct? Him right. and Khush Dilcha. Khush Dilcha, out of his own accord, found himself not in the team. Fair enough. Totally get it. What about Nawaz is so appealing to Babar Azam that he thinks that Nawaz should be in every 11 ever played? That's also a question what Amar Ramnani has. He says, you know, why is Nawaz in the team? He says, well, I understand his mediocre performance in bowling, but his batting has been nothing short of disappointment. Uh, can we look uh, at a replacement for him? So I think these are valid points. You, know, you have also a valid question because when he's bowling, he looks like a typical stock bowler. When he's batting, he looks like a below average batter. So and he's not, He's what is he then? Is he a batting all rounder? No. Is he a bowling all rounder? Not really because if he would bowl better than him. So what is his place in that 11? Good. These are tough questions. These are questions that need to be answered because if you compare him to the other left arm spinners or all rounders in other teams, like a Jadeja or a Satner, those guys are ripping it in these conditions. And Nawaz just hasn't gotten the same amount of turn. Uh, he's been too predictable. And even his batting, the man has one ODI 50, 50, that too against Ireland seven years ago. So how are we relying on him as a as an all rounder where I haven't really seen any batting performances again, maybe in the last 12 months, just that one game against India. But again, are we expecting our all rounders to perform one game in one year? Yeah, that's a very valid question. Um, a lot of anger from this game. Let's get into the game. Uh, there's, that was the start. And I think we're going to be having more nuanced conversations about this as the podcast progresses. We should dive deep into what actually happened and, what people are saying on Patreon about this, because Shazzy starts off with a, a tough, tough question. You know, there's emotions there, and Shazzy is one of those people that really shows it. This loss hurt me more than the loss to India, he says, and I didn't expect to win against India as much as I expected to win today. Do you guys agree? Absolutely. Against India, on paper, we were never a match to them. If you just compare player by player, India's team was way ahead of us, and on the day, as Bob Rotham says, on the day, they showed us why they are a potential World Cup winning team. But this game, coming back to this game, I think Pakistan was in a position to win the match and to lose it from there hurt a lot more. Uh, and that's why I would agree with Chetty. This this loss does hurt a lot more than the loss against India. What did you think? Also, like you were playing in Australia, a team that was battered. They had two losses in the bag. They were coming in defeated, wounded, crushed even some would say. And you should have just capitalized on that. Like, you are the better team currently, right? I would still say, uh, you know, like you said, uh, position by position, player by player, Pakistan's still a better team than this Australian team, without a doubt. Yeah, Australia might have a better balling attack. Pat Cummins, Hazelwood, Stark, I'll give you that. But bar for bar, yeah, Pakistan should have, should have nailed this. And it's really, it's upsetting only because you understand what the context of the tournament has become now. 
you lose from this. You Pakistan lost against India, and you know they were still steadfast at number four. You lose from Australia, now you're suddenly at number five. Now the dynamic has changed a little bit because the South Africa England game just happened, and England has got demolished. They're hanging out with the Netherlands and Afghanistan on the table. Their worst loss in ODI World Cups. Sorry, ODI history. History. So that works in favor of you, but I'm so tired of us waiting for other people to do our job for us. Like the one of the things I heard recently real, that really struck a chord with me is that the worst thing that ever happened to the Pakistani cricket team is the 1992 World Cup win. Hot take. I'll tell you why, and I totally agree with this point. The 1992 World Cup win emphasized the myth of the Pakistan cricket team. Oh, this team is elevated on a different level. Pakistan finds its way into the semifinals. You know, we will pay, we will do all the prayers, all the duas, all the druids. We'll make sure that, you know, it'll rain over there and that'll happen over there. And we'll, we'll pluck out an Inzamam from thin air and make him shine in the semifinals. And the 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 Superman myth that happens around uh around the Pakistan team started from the 1992 World Cup. You were out of the tournament. You made it back in. You made it to the semis. You won the finals. You were world champions. You had a Percy, Perseus Jackson type figure, a Harry Potter type figure, a main character type figure, the chosen one in Imran Khan leading you. Well, that was a once in a lifetime moment. That's not always going to be the case. While we were still myth, like, because you go on Twitter, it's a joke now, but there was literally a moment in time where we were comparing everything to the 92 World Cup. Oh, in 92 World Cup, this happened, so it's going to happen again this time. The closest thing that I can compare it to is the 2022 T20 World Cup, is where literally, I felt like a play-by-play, you're playing in Australia, you're, you're New Zealand in the semis, uh, England, in the, England in the final, at MCG. at MCG, you know, this team has to be that team to make sure that you, like, it was a very playbook. And I'm kind of glad that Pakistan bottled that final, because imagine having two of those. Yeah, it's a great story. Make movies out of it. Make make TV shows out of it. Sell that. Sell that, you know, the opium to the masses. Sell it, as Ghazi Akbar would say. But that will just do what... That will just hide your imperfection, imperfections. The Champions Trophy win in 2017, especially against India, did that. For three years, everybody was blinded. Well, no, we did... We, we're the best. We were a ranked eighth team in the Champions Trophy. We barely qualified for that. We barely qualified for that, bro. Like, yeah, it's a great story to tell. And Safi will be in the annals of Pakistan cricket for the rest of time because of that. And massive respect for Safi. Grazie, agenda. Haha. But then you need to come in and put in infrastructures where there aren't, right? And so the loss against Australia hurts more because India has out infrastructured you for for the past. The last time Pakistan and India were even comparable was the 90s, if I'm being very honest. If I'm being very honest. In the mid-2000s, Pakistan sort of held their own because we had star power from the 90s following over. Individual brilliances. Individ- we had the Afridis, we had the Abdul Razaks, we had the Asifs coming in for test matches especially. And then you start to see as the years, as the 2000s pro- to progress... Pakistan is sort of like inching here and there. The last convincing win was like the 2009 Champions Trophy game. Okay. And then after that, since Virat Kohli's inception and rise, it's just been crazy. So we were never on the same par with India. If we ever do beat India, it's like, wow. It's an upset. It's an upset. It's genuinely an upset. Nobody can sit here and tell me that the the Champions Trophy final was not a genuine shocker to everyone, including the team. Including the team. Like, yeah, everybody believes they're going to win. Nobody except for Ramiz believed. Nobody except for Rambo. Like that, that's why Rambo has respects. Even though he's doing the horrible job on the comms. But, yo, <laughs> he called it. And so Australia, like for like I said, we're worst. You should have won this. You were going to win this. You didn't win this. Now, what happened? What happened? Let's go first innings. Because I want to discuss what happened, at least personally speaking. I know you, this guy woke up. You woke up at 8.30 a.m. So you have no, you can't say anything about the first innings because with the people who went through it, the Discord fam, you know who I'm talking about. They felt it. So I woke up at 4.30. I see that Pakistan has won the toss and elected to field. What did you think about the toss? Because every time Bobber wins the toss, there is a huge debate on the internet whether he should have batted first, whether he should have bowled first. He bats first against India and you collapse with 92. 
you you chase against Sri Lanka and you make world record. Uh, so the question is, is Pakistan a better team chasing or are they a better team bowling first? I, I personally, like my opinion, I think Babar made a good call by bowling first because this Pakistan team, what I've seen so far, they're a better team chasing. Like They're a better team when they know exactly what they're chasing because one of the criticisms that they've received is that they're a bad team batting first because they don't know how to assess conditions. They don't know how to calculate what a respectable total on the ground is on the day on the first innings so when Pakistan knows what they're chasing they know how to plan their innings out and for I would say up until the 35th 36th over Pakistan was looking to be on track to chase this so I don't think the toss has to do much with uh with what do you think Pakistan is a team that can chase 370 on that ground uh do factor small boundaries quick outfield Flat pitch, absolutely. And you were on track. Like if, if the Jasha had a, a crazy innings, if Rizwan just continued to play the way that he did, I think we could have chased it down. Like honestly, we, we lost by 67 runs and we had like around five overs to spare. Um, it could have gone anywhere, really. It could have gone anywhere. So you're saying that the toss was not the factor? No. Uh, the factor was the drop catch. And, and this has become history. Rahat Ali in 2015, Asif Ali in 2019, Hassan Ali in 2021, Osama Mir today. Are we ever going to learn from our mistakes? Wow. Because um, there's, there's consequences to every single drop catch. And I'm just going to go through a bit of it before we actually discuss this one in particular. Rahat Ali drops Shane Watson when he was on four runs in the quarterfinal of 2015 World Cup. And Shane Watson goes on to score 64, not out, and you win the match. And they chase it down. They chase it down. Pakistan scored like 213 or something. It's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. It's a low score there too. Asif Ali in 2019 dropped Warner at 104. He gets out at 107. So it wasn't that consequential, but still just psychologically, it was bad because it gave us the one of the greatest meme moments in history. They actually, the ICC re- reminded us of it. Like they had... They reposted it, basically. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I guess we're doing that. Hassan Ali in 2021 drops Matthew Wade at 21. And then Matthew Wade, the next three balls, hits three sixes. And you are knocked out of the semis where you are the favorites to win the World Cup. They hadn't won, They hadn't lost a single game in that group stage. They were, they were they undefeated. They topped the table. I remember that. And then Osama Amir today drops David Warner at 10. And then he goes on to add 153 more runs to score 163. The TGC boys asked a really good question. Is this the most expensive catch drop of all time in history of cricket? Perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, there's also one more drop that we are not, are we considering this to be a drop? The drop of Abdullah Shafiq when Warner was at 105. It was towards uh, deep mid wicket. He he dove to catch it. The ball just burst through his fingers. Yeah. If he hit, if you're, if you're touching the ball, that's a drop catch. On the full. It's a drop catch. It's a drop catch. You're, this is international cricket, guys. This is not gully cricket. What's sad about this drop and perhaps all the other drops is that this was perhaps the easiest of all the catches, literally a dolly. And every time I look at the replay, I can't believe he dropped it because the ball just burst through his finger. Like I don't his even, hands. He didn't even touch, he the, didn't touch it. He didn't touch the ball at all. <laughs> it just went through his chest. What? Okay. Because uh, again, nuance, you know, emotions less, rationality more. What do you think happened there? The ball. So Warner skies it. Right, it's in the air for about a couple of seconds, three seconds. Usami does not have to move a single inch. He's standing where he's standing. What is happening? What is going in his head as the ball is coming down to him? What is he thinking? Here's my take. Usama Amir dropped the catch before the ball even came down. He dropped the catch when it was in the air. It's his first match in a World Cup. It's his World Cup debut against Australia. You're replacing Chidab Khan, one of your star all-rounders. The ball goes up in the air. And just that few seconds of balls in the air, you you drop the catch in your head. It's a mental game. A lot of people say it, it is a mental game. When it's in the air, you're thinking about all the consequences of dropping the catch. You're like, oh my God, it's in the air. It's Shaheen bowling. It's David Warner batting. You know, it's a dolly catch. I should catch this. If I drop it, what's going to happen? Am I going to get dropped in the next match? You know, what, is, what are people going to say? Uh, so while you're thinking of all that stuff, you lose clarity and you lose focus to actually catch the ball, your main job. So we've heard of a lot of, uh, you know, legend, legendary players talk about famous catches they've taken. Ramiz in the 92 final. Uh, Wasi Makram, uh, when he took the catch of Sachin at the Chennai test in 99. Um, they speak about how there's many thoughts going through your head when the ball is in the air. But as a professional, 
as an experienced individual, your job is to stay focused uh, and focus on the job, which is to cast the ball. And I think Osama Mir may have missed out on that. And the consequences of that catch drop, more so on, yes, the, the runs that Warner scored, but also it impacted his own bowling, I feel like. Shazi and I both want to know, did Osama Mir's drop catch cost at that game? Potentially, yes. If you if you get Warner out there, you get a Smith early, you get a Labuschagne in early. The way that Shaheen was bowling, Shaheen's that was opening looking spell like was amazing. The man bowled him in and over to Mitchell Marsh. So it could have been a different scenario if you get Warner out early. And, and you know, Pakistan is it's famous for bringing out out-of-form players back in form. And just David Warner loves playing against Pakistan. I think he averages 98 against Pakistan. This is his fourth consecutive 100 in ODIs against Pakistan. So he just loves seeing the green coming at him. Okay, so here's the question that I have. And Kavish and I have the same question. Bro, the Patreon fam and I are in sync right now. We are in line. In, aligned. We are totally in, we're one. Let's say Osama Mir, I'm going to change Kavish's question a little bit. Let's say Osama Mir catches that, right? Or doesn't catch that. That never happens. Something else happens. Ball for ball, event for event, moment for moment, was Osama Mir's bowling better than Shadab's? And I'm going to add on that, do you think that that change was called for and should should it be sustained? So firstly, I, I do think it was called for. Me and you on this podcast last episode, we called for it. We demanded Osama Mir to come in for Shadab because Shadab was just not balling at his best. There were short balls. There were full tosses. There were full balls. He just can't land one ball in six places consecutively in and over. So... The next best thing is replace him with somebody who does look like he is in form, who could be a better bowler. Osama Mir was our best um, performer in domestic list A cricket. So it only made sense for Osama Mir to come in for Shadab. You want to explore that option and you want to explore it right now when you're three games into a tournament rather than bringing him into maybe the, the later half of the tournament. So I think the change was called for. It was the right decision. It was up to Osama Mir to prove Bob Rossum's decision right. You know, have, had Osama taken three wickets, four wickets at an economy of six or seven, we would have been praising him on this podcast right here. But because it didn't go his way, I just think his bowling was average, maybe just below average. Like uh, if you compare him to a Zampa, Zampa bowled quicker in the air, flatter, wicket to wicket while Osama just gave more flight. He balled too full, sometimes too short. And when you're playing against an Australian team, the margin for error is non-existent. Like they will put you away. Once they see a bit of flight, like we saw Mitchell Marsh took him on, they used his feet. Whereas when Nawaz used his feet against Zampa, he got stumped because of how flat the trajectory of the ball was. So like for like, is comparing him to Shadav, I think Shadav would have gone for more runs Osama being at an average bowler in these conditions did okay for uh, for c- comparative to what Shadab could have done. It's just speculations, but my assessment is I feel like Osama did better or yeah would have done better than Shadab. Do you keep him? That's that's a question for the next match because the next match is against Afghanistan. It's in Chennai, so I was just doing some you know some historical evidence collecting. And I saw the home team, India, they played three spinners in Chennai and they've historically played three spinners in Chennai, which being Ashwin, Jadeja and Kuldeep. So do you learn from India and also play three spinners or do you maybe get more overs out of Iftikhar and um, and that could be your third spinner. So it's a decision for Babar Azam to make. I, I don't know what the combination will look like. Like, who do you bring in Shadab now? Like, I'll give you my 11 after, at the end because I think uh, it's not a hot take. It's, it's some, it's some, for some people, it's like a glaring switch. Like, that, this is exactly what should happen. And I'd be surprised if it doesn't. We need to also give credit to the Pakistan bowling attack for pulling it back. I was just going to say that. So it seems like, uh, to not just only to me, but a lot of people who watch cricket, that Pakistan has two different bowling attacks. The first 35 or first 38 and then the last 12. In the past in the past two games, the last 10 10 overs, if you add them up, um not between India, I'm not talking about the India game. I'm talking about uh, was it the South Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka game? Sri Lanka. Yeah, the Sri Lanka game and the Australia game, because the India game is just that didn't happen. Like for me, that didn't happen. So it's just like oh, not in my consciousness right now. So the Sri Lanka game, Australia game, 
combined in the 20 overs, this team gave 120 runs and took 18 wickets. It looks like a different bowling lineup towards the death overs. And a big reason. In in both games, Pakistan got hit for more than 350 runs and the last 20 overs of both. So 700 runs they got hit on average, right? I'm not going to go into like 362 or whatever. 700 runs on average in the past two games. And the last 20 overs of the, those games combined, you only gave 120 runs with 18 wickets. What is happening in the first 40? So I think the only way, and we've learned this from the last couple of games, barring the game from India, that the only way to stop the flow of runs in white ball cricket is to take wickets. Shaheen came back. He took five wickets. He, he bowled amazing. We have to give credit to Shaheen. We have to give credit to how hard his stroke bowled. He, his economy, the death overs in ODI is, is 6.58. Harris got hit for 59 in the first four, <clears throat> zero wickets, and got hit for 24 in the next four, three wickets. Hardest throw from the death overs seems like a different bowler because he has good variation. He balls good Yorkers. If there's any reverse swing, he can extract that. But I think the room for improvement is his first spell. Uh, like he just got smacked all over the place. Like he he looked like such an ordinary bowler. And just comparing him to another express pace bowler in the World Cup, Mark Wood, they're both getting slapped in the first few overs. Wood got sh- Taking to the cleaners today. It seems like flat pitches, small boundaries, and the pace on the ball only helps these batsmen because you have to understand, I think at this level, at the international level, like 140, 145, it's not that difficult to manage. It's about getting used to playing that pace. And once you're used to that, like 145, 150 is the same for you as 135, right? Your your body just reacts quicker. So that extra pace it's not that effective. And we're seeing that with what's happening with Mark Wood, with what's happening with Hardest Rove. So you've got to probably rely on doing something different in the first spell. Uh, but again, that overs crucial. I think Pakistan, more specifically, the last five overs, they, they took four wickets for 27 runs, which is key because Sri Lanka and Australia, they both looked like they were going to score 400 plus at one point. So forget about chasing that on any day, given any batting lineup. So so credits to the Pakistan bowling lineup. Uh, they need to find more ways to take wickets. Uh, and, and the question is, aside from Shaheen, maybe like who is a wicket taker in this team? Is Usama Amir a wicket taker? Is Mohamed Nawaz a wicket taker? Is Hassan Ali a wicket taker? Like who can you rely on to come in and, and provide the immediate breakthrough to stop the flow of runs? Yeah, Shadab was that guy for a while, but he's not him anymore. So I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. It genuinely is a shocking. It's shocking that I don't have an answer to that because this is a Pakistani bowling attack. It's supposed to be the best in the world. Self-proclaimed even, but we don't have that. Like Hassan Ali's bowling, bowling at 132. Haris is bowling 148, but he's bowling bumpers and like he's getting whipped around. Like if a Sri Lankan batsman who who barely made it to the World Cup is like pulling you for four and then you're giving him attitude for that, then it's not his problem. You are doing something wrong and you got to look into that. What I feel is the key here is that Pakistan just needs to find a way to find a way. Like I know it's, I'm trying to do some wordplay here, but think about it like this. Barber's captaincy has always been under question, right? Now this is the captain that we've backed for three years straight no other captain that I can think of was backed for three years straight in all formats. Give me one name. Was it was it Mizbah? I'm thinking Mizbah. Okay, but this is not, in Barber's defense, it wasn't like ba- Barber was announced the captain for the next ODI World Cup. It was, he's still going series by series. So his captaincy is, has always been in the th- past three years, kind of, sort of, hanging by a thread. No, but like, at the start of 2020. Two, you knew he was going to be the captain till the end of that World Cup in 2022. And as start of 23, you knew he was going to be the captain at the end of that World Like in 23, he played three series. It's not going to be like, oh, before the Afghanistan series, we're going to make Shaheen captain. That was never the question. So you knew at the start of every year that you are the one. And then not only that, Barber is calling the shots because the management is so fickle that you don't even know who the chairman is 24 hours from now. So Bobber is the one who's coming in and being like, this is the 11 I want to play. Even Inzamam comes on for the press conference before 
the team is being sent over to India, he's like, yo, this team, I maybe I made like a couple of changes. Maybe I put it in abroad. But apart from that, this team is Bobby's. So the onus when they lose also goes on Bobby a lot. And we will talk about Bobby Razam. I think that's a very, that's a whole 10 minute, 15 minute that I want to give on him. But what I'm talking about the bowling standards is Bobber has to come and speak, speak to his bowlers. He has to give them confidence. If Harris is going for 24 in the first over, okay. But the fact that Harris went for 35 and the next three, that's on you. You got to go to Harris and be like, yo, what are you doing? What is the plan here? What do you want to do? Harris, Wasim Bhai said this very efficiently on the pavilion. He said that Harris has not played first class cricket. If he wants to be an ODI bowler, he has to be in first class cricket, cricket like yesterday. And for that, he has to give up on playing all the leagues in the world. He's just signed up for the BBL as a platinum player. The BBL plays, like, you play the BBL in the winter, though. So that's not a problem. But the, the Pakistan cricket se- season is, like, in the summer. It's right now. Right now. Like, yeah, it's going through. It's going to go through all the way to December. And BBL is December, January, I believe. Like, right after the uh, Pakistan series. So that's not a problem. I don't mind them playing leagues. But when you're playing leagues, you're, it's, you're selling a product. You're not working, honing on your skills. That's the criticism we had for Azam Khan. The Kazi Azam Trophy is going on right now. We love Azam. Azam's a friend of the podcast. Bro, why are you in Lahore? Why are you in London right now? Well, because his priority is not to play red ball cricket. His pro- he wants to play white ball, and more specifically, he wants to play T20s. So why sort of waste his time playing? Yeah, but like, okay, if you only want to play cricket. T20s, and that, and then they don't expect to be called over to the ODI squad. Like in the next two to three well, years. if he's playing the list eight tournament, wouldn't he be considered if he performs there? Is he playing the list eight tournament? Or are we saying the first class performance also plays a role in you being picked for list eight? I don't know how that structure works. I'm not capable of calling out, out on that. I think there's different formats and every format has a tournament in, in, in the box on domestic setup. So if he wants to play li- like ODI cricket, he can perform in the list eight tournament. My, my point is, God, the Azam Trophy is the highest standard of domestic cricket you have. Test cricket might be dying. ODI cricket might be vanished tomorrow. But you as a cricketer have to play that, play the highest standard every time. I don't know if you're a T20 player. I don't care if you want to play freaking the 100 or T10 in Dubai. You have to be playing God, the Azam Trophy. You need those hours. You need those 10,000 hours every year on the pitch. You need to be on... You need to be baking under the Karachi sun. I need you to be on that pitch. That's the standard. The reason that Safi ever came back in the test squad was because of his Qadi Azam trophy runs. Fawaz Alam, same. Hassan Ali came back into the Pakistan team, Qadi Azam trophy runs. You got to be in there. And Haris, as great as a bowler as he is, right? he's a good bowler. Vasim Bhai said this brilliantly. Vasim Bhai said that because Harris only plays t- T20s around the world, there's only three balls you need in T20s. You need a short ball, you need a Yorker, and you need a slower ball. Right? That's all you need. And it's, also, batsman, it's predictable to know what the batsman wants to do as well. The batsman has, he's going to do two things. He's either going to stop or he's going to start. So when he starts, you have an option to take a wicket. If he stops, you're, conceding, you're not conceding runs. So it's a kind of a win-win for you in that situation, especially if you're bowling 150 express. It's tough. And you, but you cannot take that performance and translate it straight into white ball ODI cricket. Those are two different things. I just think there, I want to retaliate to your question of Babar Azam talking to the bowlers. When Sir Faraz used to do that, we used to criticize Sir Faraz. Like, why is he screaming at our bowlers? Why is he running up and talking to Hassan Ali and Wahab Riaz and Mohamed Amir? Uh, and so I, I feel like personally, like at this level, Yes, you may need some conversations, but before the match, you have clear plans. And you don't have just plan A, you have plan A, B, C. So as a bowler at this level, you know exactly what to do. I've I've hardly ever seen Rohit Sharma talk to Siraj or talk to Kuldeep. They know what to do. Siraj hardly goes for 24 and over. <laughs> but but I mean, they know what to do. Like the, you know your fields, you know exactly where to ball. I play club cricket here, right? I'm, I'm not a captain, but uh, whenever I'm bowling, the captain doesn't tell me, oh, ball here, take this field. No, no, no. I tell him, I'm an outswing bowler. I want this. I want a 6-3 field, 6 on the offside, 3 leg side. I'm going to ball this length. It's going to swing away, and I'm going to nick him off or get him LBW. So, I mean, at my club level, I know that. So why doesn't Harris Strofe know that? That's what I'm saying. Like, maybe it's a domestic performance. It's a lack of first-class cricket. It's a lack of... Like, we... 
Samin Rana was on the podcast and we talked to him about Harris Rope and we actually posted that clip on our YouTube channel as well. So if you guys are on Spotify, you can check that out. There's a 21 minute clip of him just going through Harris's story. It's a beautiful story of the how he was picked. It's a, it's he's an enigma, but it's also tra- very transparent that if he was trying to come through the nor- regular circuit, he would have been lost in the system. So that's a fault of the system. But okay, Samin Rana comes in, he picks him up, he pays for him. He's like, you're my guy. I'm going to invest in you. Samin does it. Akib teaches him. Great. Perfect. Great T20 bowler, you know, does wonders in the BBL. But it's very evident that he is a bowler picked off the street, right? Beautiful story. Again, like I'm saying, it's it's a genuinely heart-touching story, the way he's ma- maintained himself and found success through um, Lahore Kalandars, Pakistan cricket team, making semifinals, finals. Great. Love it. But then you have to put in the hours as well. Haris is a hardworking dude. If Samin tells him, I need your body weight, if Samin says, I need your body weight to be X, he did that in three months, less in a quicker amount of time than it was expected. So if the Pakistan cricket team was like, bro, we need you to first, we need you to play like a season of first class, two seasons of first class. We need those numbers under our belt. Then do it. I would, okay, if you want to play leagues, you know, Pakistan is very hot. It doesn't suit your temperament. Go play county in the in the UK. I don't mind that. I think he was there for a few matches. Go play county in the UK. Play because those situations will suit you as well. We have to also remember, like Wasim Akram, Makar, Yunus, they were county legends. Like Wasim Akram was a Lancashire county legend. Yes, and he he mentions in his book. I read his book, Sultan, that he developed a lot of his skill set from county. Like he would invent a new ball. Like he would pack. He would. Uh, discovered the outswinger as a left-hand bowler and he would then just keep practicing it and the matches in county. And once he would perfect it, he would try it for the Pakistan team. So that would just help elevate his game. I love stand-up comedy. And the only way to do stand-up comedy is a trick called writing on stage. So what that means is like all these name any to pick a stand-up comedy comic from a hat, they will go to a stage, uh, you know, a 200, 350 seater club, middle of the night. And they will practice their act on stage and see what works and what doesn't. That's what domestic cricket is. That's what county cricket is. So Haris needs to go there ASAP after this World Cup, obviously, because he he is not a bad bowler. It's not like we're sitting here and saying he's Mohamed Sami. He bowls from his head. He knows what to do. He got smacked by Kohli and that didn't let him affect him. That's like most bowlers would crush career over. Goodbye, done and dusted. See you later. But Haris is a different breed. So we have to capitalize on his aggression. It just can't be false aggression. You can't just be bullying Netherlands batsmen, right? The Dutch are stronger, if not anything. They You got whacked for four after that. So you need to make sure that your players are well equipped with those with those skills. Like I know right now we're in the middle of a tournament. It's futile to say that, but this has to come up because there are reasons why why. Uh, Harris got hit for 24 and then just continued being bad for four overs because he's capable of not being that. We saw that in the last four. I think uh, given the updated contracts of the Pakistan players, there shouldn't be any excuse of losing a few dollars um, in leagues to focus on domestic cricket because long term, that will help you become a better player. Like everybody who's been a legend, they've said how important first class cricket was. You see, I think all the Indian players, you'll hardly ever see any player that's just come off the streets without playing much first class cricket. They're literally, there's a process. They groom players. They make sure they aren't undercooked at the international stage. Um, and it just seems like in the longer form, Harris Rove, he needs some more time bowling long overs in the nets in first class, which will help improve his game. I think the next step is we should get to the Pakistan batting lineup because yeah, I was just gonna say. there's a lot to talk about here. I, I don't know how long this podcast is going to be, but it's already 40 minutes. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Wrap it up. Um, sorry, I was going to say strap up. Strap up. Strap up. Wrap it up no, is what Pakistan did, but yet. strapping up is what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, Pakistan is batting. Imam and ABD. Thoughts? Good start. I feel like in, Imam in, in ABD, like ABD for sure. Like, sorry. I think we should call him Abdullah. No. Bro, ABD is ABD. Come on, bro. I don't care. I don't care. I, everybody calls him ABD. I call him ABD. If you want to call him Abdullah, it's your prerogative. ABD is trademarked by ABD Villiers. No, it's not. Mr. 360. No, Come it's on, not. Man. Come no, on. it's not. No, 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 no. Mr. 360 is Mohamed Haris. 
<laughs> Yo, India's calling Bumrah Boom Boom. Did you know about that? Yeah, so they, if they can steal Boom Boom, which literally, after they open a company from that name. Bubblegum Company. Bubblegum Company. And remember Boom Boom was also sponsoring boxing cricket for like a while? Yeah. I think the 2011 kit is from them. Yes. Iconic kit. Good work, Boom Boom. But yes, yeah, so if you want to call Boomra that, we can call ABD, ABD. So Abdullah Shafiq uh, facing against Mitchell Stark at a World Cup. I feel like he 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 battled him pretty well. Like he he attacked him, scored some good boundaries, took singles and doubles. And Pakistan, with its current resources, I feel like got off to a great start. But a couple of things that I'm not happy about. Um, there is a lot of criticism for this match for Bob Razum, Rizwan, if there were. I totally understand that. But... There needs to be some onus on Imam and Abdullah because they got off to good starts. They were, they set a box on a platform. And when you're three chasing 360 plus, you need at least two of your top four batsmen to score centuries. And the second point is that Abdullah gets dropped at 27 and then he gets out for 64. So he only adds on 37 runs. Imam also dropped on for 48 and gets out for 70, so only adds an extra 22 runs. This compared to how much Warner made you pay is nothing, right? So at this level, you're not only getting starts, but you're also getting a chance, and you're not capitalizing on that. I feel like Imam and Abdullah both should have gone on to score centuries, like Warner, like Marsh, uh, and that would have just helped Pakistan get to a better platform to help Iftikhar and Rizwan, maybe even Babur, unleash. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the the fact that Abdullah didn't hit a century today, that's shocking because the way he was playing, he it looked like he had just started to accelerate and he was going to hit like an 80 ball century. And bro, you're giving your wickets to Marcus Stoinis. Come on, that infuriates me. The thing that pissed me off about the Abdullah decision was that he was playing so well. And then Stoinis comes, which I was thinking his four to six overs should have gone 10 and an over. That's what I'm thinking in my head. And Abdullah was probably think, thinking the same way because that's why he comes in and charges first ball. Now, that's where I have the beef with Abdullah. Is like, why first ball, buddy? Just give yourself a couple. Settle in. You're doing so good. He was overrun a ball. I think his 64 came on in 61 balls, something like that. You're over a ball, over, overrun a ball. You're doing well. You're looking good. The boundaries are small. You're timing it well. Give yourself a couple of balls. See what's happening. Maybe it's getting on a bit. Maybe it's a bit short. Whatever it is. Give yourself a couple of deliveries, make sure that you're settled in, and then go for it. But no, you go first ball and you top edge it. Come I think, on, man. I think the planning was, so if you look at Australia's bowling lineup, they're playing with four genuine bowlers. And their fifth bowler is a combination of Maxwell and Stone. So the planning from the team management must have been that you you play decent against the four bowlers, but then you counterattack Maxwell and Stoney. So if you look at the scorecard, they hit Maxwell for 40 in five overs and 40 uh, in five overs against Stoinis, but those two wickets just helped damage it. So, I mean, combined, Maxwell and Stoinis gave 80 in 10 overs, which I think is good, is good planning. So Abdullah was just trying to implement that plan and attacking Stoinis first ball to put pressure on him for the rest of his spell, because if he had really uh, Stoinis gone for like too many runs, then Australia would have needed to like bring in a Mitchell Marsh, and then they could have attacked him. So I, I think I understand where he's coming from. Okay, but, just but the execution wasn't there. First ball dot, second ball six. Is that not putting pressure on Stoinis as well? Perhaps, right? perhaps, yeah. But so like, just take your time, buddy. Like, you don't have to go all in. The thing that pissed me off was the absolutely disgusting, ugly aesthetically poor dismissal of Imam al Yeah. What was that? Why is he hitting a six? He's, he doesn't hit sixes. He could have dri- driven that same ball for four. He hasn't hit a six in this whole year in the power play. That's fine. That's not your game, but that's not what we're expecting him to do. But I'm expecting him to weave through the gaps and give me like these four fours and over. Give me two sixes and then four dot balls. I don't want that, but give me four fours and over. You're giving me four extra runs. That's Imam. And he was actually doing that in the beginning. The thing that also upset me about Pakistan's start was five overs, 40. In 10 overs, you're looking at at least 30, right? Uh, sorry, 30 more. So you're looking at like 70, 75 in the first 10. What? You end up at 59. Like what happened? Like what genuinely what happened? Yeah, uh, I think uh, Australia. This is this is obviously a good Australian bowling lineup. Uh, Josh, it is, it is. You Josh Hazelwood Cummins, was bowling. Hazelwood impeccable line and length. He bowled and made it over uh, to Abdullah. But, so, but the openers were picking up Stark well, man. They hit Stark and Hazelwood 
or, sorry, Stark and Cummins for four, and like everything was looking great. And then you give your wicket to Stoinis. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, you know once Abdullah gets out. Barbara Azam comes in and this is going to be so because because this episode is chaptered and I feel like a lot of people want to come on this podcast episode to see what we want to say about Barbara Azam. Here it is. This is what you came for. We're going to give it to you. So Barbara Azam comes in um, and he comes in when Pakistan is 134 for one and 21.1 overs. So the equation when Barbara's walking in to, to, the, to the ground, he's looking up at the scorecard, he says... 234 to win and 29 overs, the required runner being eight and over in this ground. Do you factor 58 meter boundary on third man and find like ridiculous? By the way. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Jaja pulled the six for 58 meters. Insane. Insane. Uh, not that there's any boundary in the world that's shorter for Bobber, for Iftikhar. He can that's score. That's fair. But century. I'm just saying the outfield, it felt like I was playing in Gurustan and Johor's H Park in overseas. Bro, Gachi Maiman and Karachi. Gachi Maiman and Karachi is exactly what I was thinking. Kachi Maiman and yeah, it was basically Kachi, the the pitch is a cement pitch in Kachi Maiman, and the boundaries are like a square boundary are like non-existent, genuinely. So if so, that's what it is, it's like we're talking about we're talking about myth, right? We're talking about mythical things and how Pakistan loves to mythicize everyone and everyone's a demigod and all that. And Babur is a current demigod, and and we in this podcast also rate him extremely highly. You know, self-proclaimed king. Um, we call him king. He calls himself king, apparently, as well, according to Hassan Ali podcast, right? You haven't performed this entire year. I'm speaking to Bob Razum, right? Captain season question. You're 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 calling the shots. No captain since Imran Khan has gotten this much power since ninety since the eighties up until now. Not even Shahid Afridi, who has who is arguably the most. Hollywood player that Pakistan has ever produced. His story, his book, his movies, his hair, everything. Boom Boom Afridi changed the culture of Pakistan cricket for better or for worse. That's up to debate. But he didn't even get the leeway that Bob Razam has right now. Bob Razam, okay, fine. You don't perform this entire year, right? Asia Cup, no show. 2022 Asia Cup, no show. The one game that he performed in was the 2022 semifinal. After that, nothing else. People are saying he was dropped for zero in that match. Whatever. Did he hit a 50? He did. There we go. Right? That's what we need right now. Was he actually dropped for zero? I don't remember. Yeah, he was. Oh, my Lord. Slips, I think. Okay. Anyways, he comes in. Status set. Like, if you, if the, I'm a writer. I write short stories all the time. I could not, I could not orchestrate a better staging than this match right now. You are known to chase. You chased against New Zealand and England overcast conditions. You and I were eyewitnesses to that chase. He's chased 200. Against Australia recently. Two, he's chased two 200 targets single-handedly with Rizwan in T20s. He's chased the highest chase Pakistan uh, has ever chased against Australia in Karachi. You know, he hit a century in that game as well. Imam also hit a century in that game. So 134 for one. You're, the stage is set and the thing with Bauer Azam that's pissed me off this entire World Cup, and it started like itching from the Asia Cup, but now it's gotten to the point where it's a problem. It's the first 10 balls that he plays, it looks like he's going to come in and score 150 off 110. He's middling them. He's punching them. He's driving. He's cutting them. He's like, wh- who is this guy? Is this the guy that like Virat Kohli's successor? This is the, This is him. And then he gets out in the most lucrative, ludicrous ways that you will ever see in the world. There is a montage on Twitter right now. I've seen it six times because I hate myself of him getting out the same exact way on short mid wicket at least five times in the past year. Once against England in test matches, Netherlands, India, and then Australia now. And then there was another one. I think Sri Lanka as well was a very, very similar kind of short mid wicket is your weakness, buddy. Short mid wicket. Before it was part time spinners. Kane Williams didn't Kane Williams get him out once as well. Like it was some weird. That was Hafiz who was getting out to his part time spinners in the World Cup. Yeah, but even him, he was like, "I'm not gonna give my wicket to the main bowlers, but okay, get me Kuldeep and I'll and I'll literally flick it back." It's insane. Like, wh- I'm at a loss of words because it's it's I don't know what to say to the way that he's he's been batting. The stage is set. You need eight and over. You take your time. He's playing over, run a ball. That punch over mid on. Don't want to talk about that shot. 
that should have been the shot of the tournament with Babar's century that was should have been loading. Because what he had done was mid-on was up. And I was like, oh, he just played straight to mid-on. But no, he weaved it through mid-wicket and mid-on and straight to four. That was Kohli-esque. That was beautiful. That was not even textbook because a shot like that does not exist in the textbook. He punched mid-on to four. That's the type of form you're in. And you you scoop it to short mid-wicket again. Again. Like, this is the stage for Babur to come in and, and you know, to, to emphasize the fact that he's the king. Like, he says, we call him King Babur. That he's, he's, he's the king of Pakistan cricket right now. There will never be another like him in a very long time. His stats will keep improving. He will be the best Pakistani batsman ever. Right? There's a saying in in in, pa- in Urdu called Andho Me Karna, Ra- Karna Raja. That's the type of cricket that he's now playing right now because that's not a that's not a bar to achieve. Pakistani cricket, best back Pakistani batsman ever. Okay. There's like three other. There's like Miedad, Saeed Anwar, and maybe Yusuf in white ball. And the reason that Yusuf is not cherished and not remembered the same way is because he has great stats, Yusuf does in white ball, but he's never clutch. Mohamed Yusuf never won you a tournament. Facts. Facts. He had 1,700 runs in test matches in 2006, and he didn't win you the 2007 World Cup. No show. Nothing. Choker. Didn't, does not exist. The limit does not exist. Goes to play the ICL. Goes to play the ICL. That's, that's so Pakistani. I, I totally understand your frustration. And it is a lot of frustration, not just because, yet, yes, A, because Barbara is not performing, but secondly, it's disappointing to see the way he's getting out, the method of dismissals. Uh, his wicket against India at the Asia Cup, we spoke how it was a genuinely, it was a peach of a delivery. As Nazir Hussain would say, it was a Jaffa. So you don't, you don't see anybody else, ball. you don't see anybody saying, oh my God, why'd you get out to Pandya like that? But no one's saying that. In this World Cup, if you analyze how Babar is getting out, caught at mid-wicket against Netherlands trying to pull the ball, Edge down the left side oh against my. New Zealand. I against totally Sri forgot Lanka. about that and now I'm pissed. Ball top of off, trying to guide the ball to third man against India. High, and risk, then, high risk shot, for, low risk yeah. ref, uh, rewards. Absolutely, 100%. And then caught at mid-wicket trying to pull Again, so at this level, we're talking in the PCT therapy lounge uh, and it, that delivery, short ball, at this level, you should be depositing that in the stands, man. That's like, if you're the number one batsman and if you get a loose ball like that, you should be good enough to be on top of your game to put those balls away and instead, you're giving your wicket away, the most impactful wicket. You're the number three batsman for Pakistan, the backbone of our batting, the number one batter in the world according to the ICC rankings um, and you're, you're you're giving away your dismissal this way and there's also a, a huge conversation to be have to have had again because we've had this before that Babar Azam has been a flop in multi-nation tournaments since the 2022 Asia Cup his average in the 2022 Asia Cup was 11.3 his average in the last T20 World Cup was 17.7 and his average in the Asia Cup that just happened was 18.6 if you take out his innings that happened against Nepal. And Babar Azam in this World Cup so far is averaging 20.7. Um, and there's we're, we're discussing how there's short boundaries, quick outfields, um, and flat pitches. And despite that, Babar has not been able to score big for Pakistan. That's frustrating. It's disappointing. And I've had a rough night. I've had time to think about this because you start doubting. You're like, is this guy actually as good as we think he is? Or are we putting him onto a pedestal that perhaps he does not belong to? Yeah, I mean, like, those are valid questions to have when the performance is in there. Like, remember when Virat Kohli had a bad three-year patch? A bad three-year patch. Why did Babar Azam tweet, this too shall pass for Virat Kohli? Is Virat Kohli going to do the same thing for Babar Azam because he's going through a rough patch right now? Not in the middle of a tournament. After the tournament, do you think Virat Kohli has what it takes to match Bobber's energy? No. So, I wouldn't expect So why did Bobber do it? I mean, what's the, what, that, what does that have to do with anything? No, I just think, so when, when Kohli was going through a, a rough time, a rough time, 40 plus average, still scoring runs. That's what I'm saying. So why, the Kohli rough time was him still scoring 80, 90 and people were like, yo, why isn't a century coming? It's been freaking three years. Fine. 
His rough patch is an average of 18.6 in the World Cup. 20.75. Sorry, 18.6 in the Asia Cup and 20.75 in the World That's your That's your rough time, buddy. Yeah. It's not like you're scoring 60s, 70s and then not making centuries. Your rough time is a rough, rough time. And to those people who are saying that captaincy is affecting Bauer's performance, I just have some stats here. It's very easy to just say those things in in, in, in thin air. But if you want to actually back those statements with stats, well, I have them. So Bauer and ODIs as a player, not as a captain, uh, scored 3,359 uh, runs at an average of 54.17 with 11 centuries. And then Bob Azam as a captain has 2,000 133 runs at an average of 60.94 with eight centuries. So his average, his stats, his strike rate is better as a captain. So to say that captaincy is affecting his batting is a false statement. What about, okay, but what about captaincy affecting his batting now and the past three weeks? I don't want to talk, I, don't, I want to look at it as a, an individual vacuum event. This World Cup, do you think his captaincy is being affected? His batting is being affected by his captaincy. The way he's getting out, I think so. It's a it's a combination. It's of- a mental thing. It's not that he's being beaten by and no baller has beaten Babar Azam this this World Cup. He has gotten out himself. Sorry, I'm being very. <laughs> I just hit the mic. You're being he, Shabash, I'm being very. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Nawaz is back. So good luck to at him. least one of them are back. One, somebody's back. See, so <laughs> one of the Nawaz is back. One of the Nawazes are back. <laughs> and one should be out. Like we got one back, we want the one, the other one away. But what was I even saying? Yeah, none of the dismissals in this World Cup has been by the magnificence of the bowling. It's been his own doing. So there is something in his head that is making him do that. There is a lot on his plate. You know, if we're if we're saying that Bobber is uh, the coach, Bobber is the batting consultant, Bobber is uh, picking the team, Bobber is a selector, Bobber is the captain, Bobber is the team team start strategist. So there is a lot on his plate, um, and I just the question is like, how does he come back? And you know, Temur Khan from Patreon, he asked the same thing. He says, how do you think he bounces back from such an untimely succession of failures? I don't believe, or I refuse to believe that he's overrated. Uh, so how do you think we can get the barber back to the barber that was in the 2019 World Cup? Because it's not a question of his ability because he has performed the last ODI World Cup against top teams. He was the third or fourth highest run scorer uh, of the tournament overall and the highest scorer for Pakistan. So he's shown us that he can do it. So why isn't he doing it and how can he do it is a question for you. It's the same thing. It's a Fakhar Zaman equation. It's a one good innings. Should have been against India, choked it. Should have been against Australia, choked it. So you have to take the crown off now. The crown has to be off until Babar Azam deserves it to be put back on again. He deserved it consecutively for the past three years and since 2019. I agree with that. In bilateral series. In bilateral series. Sure. So Babar is the king of bilaterals. For now. And a no-show in multi-nation tournaments. For now. Yes, half the tournament is done. We still have five more games. So they could that could be a game changer. But Babur is Babur is equipped to hit back to back to back centuries. He's done it twice. He's done it twice. He's done it twice. So we're not saying that he's not capable of a big innings or a big score. There's five games left. You got to win three of them at least. Four to definitely qualify. Three to make it tough for yourself. So. No, they got to win four at least. And no, you, you can make you can win three and still make it. Because okay. your competition is Australia, not England. You mm-hmm. only have one team yeah. vying for the fourth spot. So we will, we'll talk about that maybe in a later podcast, maybe at the end of this one, because this one is running a bit long. And people didn't want us to go long. And honestly, we don't plan for these things. <laughs> they just happen. We're hitting 105 minutes, Bashar. Damn. So yeah, we'll, 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 but we'll talk in length of it. I don't want to cut it down because it's going a bit too long. Babar just needs one good innings. This is the time now or never. You like myths. You like demigods. You like being, you know, the main character, Superman. This is it. It's here. The kryptonite was released. You were affected. Can you bounce back? You got five games. You're number three. You're the greatest batsman of all time for Pakistan. Prove it. Yeah. Are you going to be another Mohamed Yusuf? Or are you going to be Sayyid Anwar? Are you going to be Javed Miyadad? Or are you going to be freaking Yunus Khan? And White Bulls, yeah. Make your choice. This is it. Now or never. He's going to play the next two World Cups. 
Bob Rosam is. He's only 29. He's he can bat till he's 37. He I I can see that. Like he's gonna play 2028, is it? No, 2027, and maybe 31 as well. He's gonna play the next two World Cups, right? Fine, fair enough, good for you. But again, Yunus Khan played five World Cups or four World Cups: 2003, 7, 11, 15, 15. Jesus Christ, right? Like. Sure. Are you going to be that? Who let guy? him? <laughs> Who let him? <laughs> That's a different question. Like, are you going to be that? Or are you going to genuinely be somebody like Sayyid Anwar who's going to win you games? Bob Razum right now is writing his own legacy. He is the author of his own destiny. And the next five games, I believe, will determine how the world will remember Bob Razum for the next, to, up until the next World Cup. Um, we spoke briefly on how Pakistan at one point was in a position to win this match. And I think this was when if the and Rizwan were playing, Pakistan required 103 off 72 balls, run rate of 8.58. And we saw Pakistani middle order struggle against spin, especially if the, and what's funny is because before the tournament, if the was speaking to Mazur Rashid on an interview and he said that Pakistanis play spin the best, you know, if not us, our, the Gora player is going to, or the white player is going to play spin well, like the non-subcontinent player is going to play spin well. Ever since he said that, the last two games, he's given his wicket against Kuldeep Yadav, wrist spinner, and this game against Zampa, wrist spinner. So that statement has backfired, and it felt like Australia had saved in Zampa's overs for when FD was going to come because he was smashing the Pacers, bro. He, he had three sixes, and it looked like it was going to be Razak against South Africa in that one crazy match he played. This could have been Ifti this, this time, but Zampa comes in and takes in Ifti and Rizwan, and you just... You were yeah, never so like, why don't you just see off Zampa? Like, why, I don't know why, why they wanted to attack Zampa, well, who's actually like, bowling really well. Ifti was trying to take in a single, bro. He was taking a simple single, and he gets out, and then Rizwan was the one that, that was attacking him, and gets LB. No need to do that. You did not need to do that. Rizwan, I hate the shot that Rizwan plays where he goes like, like he's standing on middle and then he walks all the way to like eight stump off uh, from the off stump. And he's trying to like sweep that to midway. I don't like that shot. It's successful. It works. But that screams, that screams, oh, I have no offside game. Yeah. That screams like, oh, I cannot cut this But ball. he does because he's shown it against um, Sri Lanka. Lanka that he can hit inside out sixes. So I don't know why he didn't try it here. There's another important thing they need to talk about. So, yes, those back-to-back wickets really hit Pakistan um, badly. But then our tail didn't fight to save our net run rate. And right now, we're at number five, despite having the same points as Australia, because our net run rate is bad. And there's a question from Tabish from Patreon. He says, why has our team not tried to play out the 50 overs uh, in the last two games? Uh, just to make sure our net run rate is not affected as badly, which cost us the semifinal spot in the last ODI World Cup. The same question, uh, more or less, was from Raja Osama Abbas, also from Patreon. So, I mean, why do you think Pakistan's tail didn't really, you know, fight or wiggle it? I don't think, I mean, I heard Hassan Ali's press conference the day before the game, and he said, oh, we don't care about net run rate. If you win the game. He said that? Yeah, he's like, net run rate doesn't matter. If you win the games, we get the points. Bro. So I mean, that's it kind a of lack proves, of game sense. That's that's what he just proved it by doing this. Like you could have been number four still. That's straight up stupid if you said that. Yeah. So I don't know. Like it's just I genuinely think it's lack of game awareness. They should have stuck it out. They had four point three overs left. If they score another twenty thirty runs, that run rate maybe doesn't you know change. Ex- you don't. You may not. You may still lose your fourth spot, but you know the gap is less. There's more chances of you going forth and, you know, making those runs and clearing up that gap in the next games. So, I don't know. The tail, everybody has to step up. This is high time. This is make or break. You're not trying to learn on the job anymore. The job is here. Because we saw uh, the game that Netherlands beat South Africa. So, despite them beating them, South Africa's last wicket, like, Keshav Maharaj was smacking it all over and he made sure that despite losing it, like, there was a point where they knew they were going to lose and... The strategy from then on was to not lose by a big margin because, again, net run rate will be the name of the game. Uh, maybe in another week or two when we're in the business end of the tournament. We've said so before. The net run rate is what won you the 92 World Cup and the net run rate is what lost you the 2019 World Cup. Absolutely. So respect it. 100%. There's also a, just an interesting stat. 
the difference in the number of sixes that both teams had. Australia had 19 sixes in their innings, and Pakistan only had six sixes. And this was, again, like you mentioned, boundaries were 58 meters, small, literally, bro. Warner hit one six that hit the roof, and it came back to the ground. Like, if somebody caught that with one hand, that's out in the gully. <laughs> yeah, one hand touch. That's true. Uh, but we don't have that player. Who's going to come in and hit sixes? If Abdullah had could. Three of them. Abdullah could. If they could, Rizwan could. But for the Rizwan to hit sixes, he needs to have like 50 balls under his belt before he can do that. Yeah. In order for Abdullah to hit sixes, he needs to already have had a 50. So they need to get the starts and they did. The stat that really pissed me off was that Australia played 152 dots, which means that we kind of had them bottled in. And we played better than them. We only played 129 dots, which I really appreciate. That means we were rotating strikes. We were getting singles. We were taking runs where we needed to, but we couldn't capitalize. That's what pissed me off about this game. It wasn't one-sided. We were there. We saw it. 107 off of 75 at one point, what was it? I just saw it here. 103 off of 72 was required. You bank Pakistan to chase that in any format. Yep. Any format. Mm -hmm. Pakistan is chasing that. With Rizwan and FD on strike. Come on, man. They were set. They had a good Come partnership. On. That's Come what on. That's what stings about this defeat. And I think it's really important for us to talk about the way forward as to how Pakistan does going forward. So I wanted to talk about that. I said earlier on the podcast that there's a combination change that I think is glaring that should be made. And it's this. Same 11. Switch Shada for Nawaz. Done. There's also a... You play two leg spinners. There's a hypothetical conversation happening about if Nawaz is not performing with the with the ball, and if you want to add a batsman, bring in Saman Ali Allah. Because then he, him and Ifti can ball five overs each, and at least you'll note that Salman can score some runs. So it's an interesting thought. I maybe would love to like so look into it So the two changes, okay, then, then, then I would do this. Do you agree with that though? Yeah. Salman for Nawaz? Yeah, I see it. Totally. Totally. Because then the batting order also gets really messed up because where does, That's what I was just where say. does Salman come in? Where does, how, how so, low okay, does Ifti go? Let, let's say this. Let's, let's say Osama out, Shadab in. Because you need Shadab now. Like this has been a glaring, th Shadab has to be in the 11. Just Shadab's uh, bowling, sorry, his, his fielding and his batting overpowers Osama's bowling. Yes. Um, and Shadab in this match, uh, I was just talking to a friend about this, that Shadab, despite being the 12th man, had a better positive impact of the match than Osama Mir because he took two catches. Um, I think he eventually caught Warner himself on the boundary. Yeah. Uh, and then he also took a catch of uh, Marnus on the deep mid wicket. So Shadab, the fielder, we need him. He's the best fielder in Pakistan. He's the best fielder we've had in a long time. So And he can bat. Yeah. Yeah. So... So you're saying Shadab in for Nawaz? Is that what you're saying? Shadab in for Osama. Salman in for That's Nawaz. That's going to crush Osama's confidence. That's going to shatter him. You drop a catch, you perform bad, you lose a match, and then you get dropped. So if Shadab continues to bowl poorly, are you going to say the next match, bring back Osama, bro? You know, is this the musical no, Shadab needs to be in the team. And I think Salman also needs to be in the team. So who do you put in? You have to sit Osama out. So, so Osama for Shadab and then Nawaz for Salman. Yeah. So if that's the what if that's the Salman Ali Aga that you want to you want. That's tough. Also because the next match is in Chennai. Chennai is like I mentioned is a spin friendly pitch, and I definitely feel like I know Nawaz has not performed yet in this tournament, but in those conditions, he might be our key player, a key might. bowler. I've been hearing this for the past two years. Like. You just need to have your your bases covered, like still going in with a genuine like off spinner. Because you have Ifti to do that for you. Bro, I don't trust Ifti's bowling to uh, ball that good against uh, in, in Chennai. Like, yes, he'll do well, but if you might has need been, a genuine left arm spinner. No, but Ifti has been consistently really good. Uh, the semi, the quote-unquote semifinal against Sri Lanka and the Asia Cup, he took three wickets for like 45. Ifti had the best two of Pakistan in this match. A over 37 runs. 30 dot balls. Why are you not backing Ifti for this? Because Ifti is like a uh, nubby. Bro, Ifti is, he's risky. He'll do well some matches. He won't do well that match, the other matches. Okay, okay. Let me, so you need to have your, let me, let me tell you. Insurance this. policy. You keep Osama. Because you know, you've guilted me into keeping Osama. 
You see Kibusama, he's because he's a genuine he's a genuine risky leg spinner, right? Maybe he had a bad game. And he also got dropped. You have to remember that Babar Azam dropped uh who did he drop? Steve Smith. Steve Smith on Ifti's ball. On on uh, Osama's ball. Yes. So genuinely he was okay. Right? If he had caught that, then he has two for sixty. Not that bad. You got you got Ifti, who's gonna be bowling your nubby. He's gonna be like your nubby. You got Osama, your leg spinner, you got Shady, your leg spinner. Stick with those three. Right? So you come in, Nawaz goes out, Shady comes in, Shady plays over Osama, and that's your that's your eleven. So same eleven, Shady instead of Nawaz, and you, you sit Salman out. I think that's the Risky. combination you should go for against uh, Risky Afghanistan. Uh, the why more, though? Why is it risky? The more that I think about it, I just think Pakistan should probably play same eleven because if you drop Osama now, and Shadab continues to bowl poorly, what do you do? Like, do you bring back Osama again? Or no, you play Osama and uh, you play them both, and then you drop Nawaz for Osama. Yes, Nawaz is a no show. But, but what is Nawaz I, giving I'm just to this team? In these conditions, you might do well because it's spin friendly conditions. Chennai, like I told you, India played three spinners here. India. So we are as well. If the uh, Osama genuine and spinners, Jadeja, Osama and Shady Ashwin. are genuine spinners. But if he is not, if he is a part time spinner, you get a couple in from Saud. I don't care. I don't want Nawaz near this team right now. I would rather play a complete bowling lineup than a half complete bowling lineup, and then have Afghanistan spinners overpower you, which could you, be a possibility. Is Shadab one of one of the best spin players in Pakistan team? Spin players, yes. Should he not be playing against the best spin attack in the world? Yes. Did he not just hit fifty something off uh, four thirty five against against Sri, against Afghanistan and Sri Lanka? Yes, winning you that game. Yes. So what are the odds? Well, why would you not play Chalab? Okay. Okay. Having said that, I'm convinced now. Yes, because I think Osama Amir's batting at number eight is it's an, an additional weak link in our side. That's what I'm saying. He can bat. He scored zero, man. He can. He looks like a tape ball player batting. Yeah, he's swinging his. He's swinging an axe. Like yeah. I'm not saying maybe Osama's a really good batsman as well. Confidence is key. He doesn't have any. Yeah. So it's like playing a Fakhar Zaman. Fakhar Zaman had no confidence, mm. and he cost you the Asia Cup. So that would be my eleven. If you want to keep Osama, then Shady comes in for Nawaz. If you want to get rid of Osama, then Shady comes in for Osama. But then you gotta replace Nawaz with Salman Ali. Awa. True. At least True. Salman is a genuine batsman. He can give you at least thirty odd off thirty odd. True. Imagine, imagine these conversations happening in the Pakistan dressing room. Like, is Bob Razan making these calls? Is he consulting yes. with the, the the team management? Bobber is making these calls. This is Bobber's team. So nobody else is making these calls. But maybe there's something to be, I mean, I feel like what Bobber has done right now, if he doesn't at least make semis, then what he has done is basically spoil the chance of any captain in the future for the next 20 years to call his shots. Did we mention the question from Taimur Khan from Patreon? Because uh, he, he was asking about the same thing. He was asking about if we want to pursue, uh, persist with Osama in the next matches, given it's in Chennai, um, and you know, despite him being expensive, should we give him another chance? So I think we've just answered Taimur's question. Yeah. Uh, just to wrap everything up and put a bow in it, there's a question yeah, from bro, Ali I have Khan. A headache. <laughs> uh, he asks, "What is our path to semis, according to you guys?" And um, I think the simple answer is that is. Oh, we forgot to turn on these lights. Uh, to be safe. You've got to win all the matches because net run rate might play a key role. Uh, and I think Pakistan may still be able to qualify if they win the next four of their five matches. Uh, but this will include them beating an inform South Africa, an England team, an inform New Zealand team who at the time of this podcast recording is unbeaten. So it's an uphill task. It's doable. Uh, but I just think it's very tough. Like Pakistan will need to play out of their skin they need individual brilliances from players um and it's looking tough despite being a Pakistani I've got to be grounded and realistic and I just want to say it's looking tough at this point because ultimately we might be having this conversation that did the did, did Pakistan team really deserve to be in the semis have we played our best cricket this tournament so far my question is in 2019 did Pakistan deserve to be in the semis yes they did and that's only because the last four or five games that they played, they were playing out of their skin. What we still have five games left. Yeah. So you never know. You can see you can a Pakistan team comeback is always on the cards. I believe that wholeheartedly. There's nothing in this team that convinces me not to. I started we started this podcast with the question 
is this the best Pakistan team to go into a World Cup since 1999? Those are, there are doubts on that statement, but I know for a fact that this is the best Pakistan team that we have right now. Do you remember that scene in The Dark Knight Rises where Christian Bale is, or Bruce Wayne is in the, he's in the trenches, he's in the ditch. Yeah. And he tries to grab that rope and jump out. I think he has a couple of failed tries. And the third one he has, he has belief. He has trust in himself. And he jumps and he is one of the only people aside from Bane, Bane himself to climb Ex- out of that ditch. Yeah, exit the ditch. And come out a free man. We've made references of the Shawshank Redemption, of, you know, Andy Dufresne crawling through a mile of shit and coming out a free man. Pakistan right now, they're not the shit, but they're in the shit. And the only way out is if they keep crawling, if they keep moving. Um, and I think on that note, I just want to say thank you all for listening. Beautiful. This podcast, uh, it's been long overdue this episode. So thank you guys for being patient with us uh, to be part of our Zoom call that's happening tomorrow up with our patrons. You can sign up with the Patreon link in the description. Uh, to be part of the Discord community for free, you can sign up with the link, which is also in the description. Uh, thank you guys for listening. This is Bashar signing out. And with me, my brother and co-host, as always. Now that I say, yeah, go easy on yourself, guys. This is not the end of the world. And we will see a brighter day very soon. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.